Right, let's go back to um, measuring the emotion, knowing what the emotion is. Um, I know, for example, that you're very in you've been very passionate already about measuring and looking at the value of emotion. Is there, um, is there something that you learned today or sparked some creativity in what you could do next? Well, I like the concept of, um, we, we, we spoke about dark matter and the unobserved and uh, how you can infer how people feel from what they do um, or what they're likely to do. And we spoke about the, um, the, 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 how we look at from an observed point of view, whether it's measuring um, stories or whether it's measuring text analytics or whatever it might be. And I think the thing that I got was actually about this oscillation between the two. The fact that um, if you can look for where the uh, hot buttons are and what people uh, do, then you can go back and define the situation to see is that that's the hypothesis, do they feel that way as well? And I think for me, uh, the best way to infer emotion is to uh, define the situation, uncover where there is a possibility that something might be going on here, and then go and ask your customers whether that is true and fair. And I think that that, that kind of observed, unobserved type, type of situation um, is a little bit new. So let me give an example of that, if I may, Ed. So if it was um, you're measuring the web click rate throughs on digital, um, as Ruth was describing, and you have analytics on that, and it looks like there's some odd behavior from this customer or customer group, uh, that is a point where you fire off, well, that's now we ask the question, now we need to ask the why, rather than the normal way that uh, companies do it, which is just fire off a server here, there, and everywhere and um, then um, to ask questions like how do people feel about this web experience. I mean, you know, I think uh, the formal way of defining the situation is, is a good way to, to look at emotion. Correct. I think another thing, non-conscious as well, is what I got out of it. A large slice of how we react emotionally is, um, um, is not in a way where we think about it. We don't walk through uh, a shopping center thinking about our emotions. We just react to things that are salient or not and then frequently forget them. So uncovering that in un unconscious effect on emotion is really important and something that um, companies ill consider. Mm -hmm. And if there was one thing you think you'd like to be able to do a little bit more of to help answer your questions and help your, your clients and your customers, is there anything else that you'd like to have an extra insight on or take a step forward in one of those particular areas of measurement or yeah. customer value? I think um, I think the culture piece is interesting because it is a completely, it's a little different angle, isn't it? Get people more to empathize with what it is to be a customer. Um, how you can um, get the leadership in particular to empathize. Um, because they seem to be the, the bottleneck in terms of emotional engagement sometimes. So they would um, say it has to be on an ROI against this action or there has to be a scale measure or something empirical, grounded and objective. But I think if you can just get them to engage more in the life of a customer, then I think you're halfway there. And I think uh, then measurement should be easier to do and fall into place, even though it doesn't directly answer the question. I think the other thing is to get uh, companies to at least think of changing the way they measure emotion, to move away, excuse me, away from rational scales, for want of a better term, um, to consider other methods. Um, and I think that particularly as emotion is so fleeting and changing, they need to do that. Stop thinking about movements on the satisfaction on NPS charts so much and start thinking that actually if we really want to understand emotion, traditional metrics don't do it for us and we need to think of another way. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Oh, I, one other thing I was just thinking about, when I was in the room there was a moment when I heard, and it was to do with, I said it with Peter a bit about the dark matter or measuring things that are hard to see, that actually it was almost like we were introduced to, as the, the year of emotion, you know, as, as apparently, although we looked at how actually we know that emotions is important. It's, yes. Uh, we're just doing, trying to measure it differently and look at it in different ways because of the complexity, etc. Yes. 
But then I thought there was a moment where actually the emotions potentially are the noise or the result or the outcome of things going well, and actually we need to look at something deeper. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, good point. And that fits, actually, if I may, to the customer strategist article I was writing. Because um, I think, I'm not going to say emotions are a red herring. They're not. But emotions have to be the outcome of something that affects you personally. So we only feel an emotion if there's an interruption in our daily living that affects our well-being, interruption in goals we seek or whatever. So you're only going to feel an emotion of happiness if at that moment emotions tell you and inform you that things are going well. You only feel a negative emotion if something has happened that affects your well-being. So it is right, in my opinion, to go beyond emotion, to look at what are those moments that impact my well-being, or how I appraise things as a customer, define those situations, coming back to the earlier point, then I think you can get a better handle on emotion, actually. Because the example that was given by Peter was about the airline and the legroom, the, the need for extra legroom. Well, that's a fairly, okay, functional, but something people want, something people you can define, something people that you don't need to infer. You can just get people a room and ask in the focus group, for instance, or whatever you do, and then you can um, make a feasible assumption that if you were to invest in that, that is meaningful to, to the customer and therefore they would feel an emotion. And likewise, we shouldn't uh, ignore the employee emotions either, which sometimes we want to do. Uh, what is the employee journey and what is meaningful to them? So I think your point is really well taken and I think it fits very much with cognitive psychology but emotions don't, we don't float on a crowd of emotion as a reason for emotion. Define those reasons and then emotions will follow. Mm, great, and I think on that on the last bit that then left, left two choices. I think we can fix the functionality, the, the fit for purpose, the need. Yes. Or we can look at the other parts that produce a, a positive experience despite the functionality. Yes. Um, and, and there's two different investment choices. Exactly, and this is really interesting. So. Um, in terms of what David was saying, in terms of customer value creation, in terms of looking for extra value dimensions. So the good thing about uh, thinking emotionally is it takes our view away from pure thinking. We deliver a function. And it asks the question, what other value dimensions there are in the customer's mindset that we can use and monetize? Mm. So um, if we were to look at our journey maps and put an emotion overlay, we'd actually be asking the question, okay, we functionally deliver quite rightly an easy seamless experience but if we look at engaging the emotions what does that mean what extra value dimensions does that mean apple is the classic example focus say for instance on aesthetic design or how it is used um, which affects how people feel and i think as long as you're at least asking the question you're moving your journey maps along from being inside out transactional and just focusing on the function which can only be to benefit of companies. Tops, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much, Ed.